Hey, weirdos, I'm Ash. And I'm Elena. And this is Morbid. It's morbid. I always have to repeat it. I don't know why. It's a weird routine that I do. It's entirely possible that I do that too, but I don't no i think we both do it sometimes i'm a self-aware queen and other times i'm (laughs) I'm a delulu queen (laughs) delulu queen living a a grand delulu (laughs) yeah i'm usually i i'm pretty self-aware of my annoying traits (laughs) i think i'm not gonna change them but i'm aware of them that's the most Capricorn shit you've ever said. I know I'm annoying, but fuck you. Yeah, that's, that's straight up. I know up. I'm annoying, but deal with it. That's straight up how I feel. Unapologetic. Like, I love it. Yeah, I'm very self-aware, but like, there's no way I'm changing. So. Good for you. That, I'll you grow. know what? I'll grow, but I won't change. <laughs> good. That's, but like in growth. Just good. In growth, there is change. Nah. Not yeah. in my growth. No. <laughs> she's, she's something, everybody. She's a girly. She's a girly. She's, She's girly. out here. Wild. I am out here. She's out here in these streets, not She's changing wilding. but growing. Question mark. <laughs> we don't understand it. I don't. But you know what? I don't claim her. The girlies who get it get it. You know what? I do claim you. My though. fellow Capricorns get it. We grow. We it's do true. not change. <laughs> I honestly, I really feel as though you're. I, we were just talking about this. I feel like you're becoming more and more of a Virgo with each passing day. I can, I definitely have Virgo. I mean, it's in my big three, isn't it? Well, that's what I'm saying because you're a Virgo rising. And I heard um, that like the older you get, like the more you go through life, you kind of morph more into your rising Mm. sign. Mine is Sagittarius. I feel that. And I like Saggies. So like I'll morph into a Saggy. Yeah. Saggies, I feel like maybe they like don't give as much of a fuck about things as Geminis do. I hope. Maybe. It's just a hope I think of mine. It's just a hope. Maybe yeah. they hope not to. Maybe. I don't know. Well, that was astrology with Ash. It <laughs> I was... just, you were just like, but you're becoming a Virgo. Yeah, so. you are. I just, I feel it. Because yeah. Dave is a Virgo and I'm noticing a lot of attributes of Dave that you are. Yeah, Dave and I are having. very, have found each other realizing that we're very alike. You are. Yeah. There's moments where we're just like, huh. <laughs> well, and Drew <laughs> is that. a Capricorn and like. He he definitely possesses like some Capricorn mm-hmm. qualities for sure. He's a January Capricorn. He's a January Capricorn, which is different, but he's also a Taurus rising. And I was saying to him that lately I feel like he comes off way more Taurus. Ah. But they also say that you come off to other people like like your rising sign is what you present to other people, I'm pretty oh, sure. So I present a Virgo. Yeah, and that makes sense. I feel like Virgos are misunderstood and sometimes I feel like you're misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah. Capricorns are too. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're both in those. Yeah, and then you got cancer in there, which just like fucks it all up. Which is really wild. Yeah, your big signs are chaotic. <laughs> they're very, they're scary. Mine are <laughs> super fucking chaotic too. Mine are just scary. Yeah. It's interesting that we both have water moons. I just huh. realized that. Look at that. Because I'm a Pisces moon, which I don't like to claim out loud, but here we are. <laughs> well, you know, I have... Actually, never mind. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Anyways... <laughs> Let's get into the story. Let's, yeah. Let's stop talking now that we've ourselves. all discussed our risings and big threes. Yeah. I hope you guys yelled yours out at us, too. Yeah. Go I hope you it. did. I heard That's it. That's what I hope for us. Oh, my God. Is that when we go through these little weird, uh, like, uh, intros that we just start talking about shit, that you guys are just <laughs> yelling stuff back. I hope so. It feels that way. Yeah. I feel like my friends are out there in their, in their cars. And they're not and... too long, so I feel like you can hang in and, like, yell back at us for a minute, and then we're like, all right. Yeah, like, ah, right. Sh- 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 get, sh- sh- getting back on track. So yeah, let's get back on track. Let's get back on track. This is Sharon Kinney, aka La Pistolera. I can't say it in an American sounded accent. Pretty. I just have to say it. Yeah, in the it sounded Spanish really accent. pretty. Um, but that's the case that we're covering. We're in part two of that, and in part one we covered, you know, Sharon's. I would call Chaos. it a failed marriage to her first husband. <laughs> yeah, I would also call that a failed marriage. Yeah, his untimely and wild, wildly, wildly suspicious death. Yes. We covered her affair with a married man named Walter. And then we found out that Walter's wife, Patricia, had been murdered. And Sharon had not only been the one to find her, but was also the last person to be seen with her the very day that she went missing. Mm-hmm. And then finally, at the end of part one, Sharon was arrested right after Patricia's funeral. So there's that. I've said it like 42 times, but I am just going to say it one more time. Trial heavy in the beginning of this one. Stick with me. 
I'm I'm sticking. I'm here. I'm glad you are. I'm not like, going anywhere. Required by contract to be here. So <laughs> while that means a lot to me that you're not going anywhere, yeah, it's also just the law. Yeah, I mean, but that if you're not true. contractually obligated to be here, I appreciate you and I love you. I love that. Yeah, we're all in this together. That's good. We're just not all under the same contracts. No. But the next morning, June first, after you know she was arrested. Sharon appeared before Magistrate J.J. Brady in an independence courtroom where she was formally arraigned with the first degree murder of Patricia Jones and a preliminary hearing was scheduled for June 16th. In the meantime, she was held on $20,000 bond, which friends and relatives actually wasted no time pulling together and she was released that very afternoon. What? I feel like even (laughs) that speaks to like the manipulation she was able to conjure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, friends and relatives were like, yeah, I know that two people have been mysteriously shot or murdered around you lately in a span of two months. But, like, I don't think you have anything to do with it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, she's a a high-level manipulator. She's a wily one. That's what we've been discovering. But then... After the arraignment for Patricia's murder, the sheriff's department actually asked District Attorney William Collette to file charges against Sharon for the murder of her husband. There you go. I was waiting for that. He did that later that afternoon. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue for the prosecutor's office was the lack of forensic evidence connecting Sharon to both murders. There was not a lot of forensic evidence. And remember, it's the 60s, so... They didn't have like a shit ton that yeah. they could do. Like there wasn't any DNA. To, there was DNA to test, but there weren't any tests yet to true. figure it out. Very true. So they knew she was the last person to be seen with Pat- Patricia Jones. And she had been uncooperative from the start of the investigation. But with the fourth bullet or the 20, or excuse me, without the fourth bullet or the 22 caliber pistol used in the shooting, prosecutors knew that getting a conviction would be an uphill battle. Mm. But they were ready to climb uphill. Investigators, citizen volunteers, and even a troop of Boy Scouts had scoured the crime scene with metal detectors, like I mentioned in part oh, wow. one, but still they hadn't found any evidence. But then, finally, on June 2nd, a sergeant with the sheriff's office located the fourth slug lodged about six inches into the ground directly under where Patricia's body had been found. Oh, so it was lodged in there. It was lodged into the earth. So then you wonder, I mean, I don't know if I'm being like super. Like, no, you go for it. You theorize. Because we were saying how we like they believed initially that she was brought there and probably dumped because of the lack of blood. And then they so, found that barn. So my thought process here is because that barn kind of like disappeared, you said. It does feel like it, it like it kind of does disappear because they've they theorized that maybe she was shot there because there was some evidence that like some something was shot there. Yeah. Or somebody shot there. But the cause of death was the shot to the head. Yes. So I'm wondering if all that happened somewhere else, she was dumped there and they did one more shot to the stomach to try to confuse the whole thing. Maybe. And that's why there's no blood because she had already died from the blood, from the shot to the head. So it's not flowing. That's actually brilliant. That's not some investigator type shit. That's just me over here being an investigator. Yeah. You know. That makes a lot of sense. What are you writing? Like a novel about murder or something? (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> no <laughs> no never yeah that i didn't even think of that. could have been it that definitely could Perhaps. have been it it's huh. pretty it's pretty shady because that's they the... never really account for the lack of blood at the scene yeah like, so maybe that's it could be why yeah it's just like an overkill kind of thing to confuse things or just like an angry overkill yeah like one more you know one more mm-hmm, you're right mm. but anyway finding that missing slug was huge that yeah was a huge win regardless But it was immediately followed by a pretty big blow once they realized that the coroner had sent Patricia's body to the mortuary with the two remaining slugs still in the body, which had then been buried. Come on, everybody. So not, so yeah, he sent her body off to the mortuary and she had already been buried with those slugs still in her. Great. A spokesperson for the sheriff's office told reporters, we feel there was a negligence at the time of the autopsy. You feel that? They did feel that. I also feel that. I feel that from, you know, decades after. Me too. I still feel that. I still feel it in my bones. And according to the sheriff, investigators had made the explicit request for the coroner to hold the body for additional testing and removal of the remaining slugs. But the coroner disregarded the request, sent Patricia's body to the mortuary where she was prepared for for burial, 
destroying what could have been vital evidence in this case. Why the fuck? She's a murder victim. Why are you sending her off with evidence inside of her body? It gets worse. The more investigators dug into Patricia's case, the worse things looked for, pros- for the prosecution. Not only had legit evidence been buried with the body, but the embalming process actually occurred before the coroner performed the autopsy. Shut the fuck up. They embalmed what? the body first before he did the autopsy. What? Colette told the press, it's just all botched up. How badly this series, mista- series of mistakes will hurt us will have to be determined later. This is not the first case they messed up for us, and it probably won't be the last. Like, How do you even... How? And also, if this is not the first case that they've messed up for you and you're pretty confident it's not going to be the last, uh... We think it's time to hire a new coroner? Yeah, I'm going to go on on a limb here and say that coroner is not good at their job. Like, what? Also, I wonder if this, where where did this take place? Independence, Missouri. I wonder if this is a, this is one of those cases against coroners, like, the, against, like, a voted in coroners. Oh. Because it's like, this could be a case where this guy had no fucking business doing any of this shit. It kind of sounds sounds like like I'm going to look this shit up. Go for it, because it does sound like it. According to the prosecutor's office, the coroner even tried to cover up his mistakes at multiple points in the investigation. He told detectives, this is wild. You're going to you're going to I don't even know what you're going to do, but you're going to lose your mind at this. Oh, no. He told detectives finding the slugs in the body would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Literally shut the fuck up. What? Like, you have literal entrance wounds. That's the thing. Like, slugs don't appear in a body. There's a fucking exit wound that you can follow pretty quickly. Looking for a needle in a haystack? Looking for a a needle in a haystack? Are you kidding me? Like, what are you saying? Is this guy all right? Who is this man? No, because I'm I'm not done yet. This is what's really going to send you. He also told them that he did not want to conduct tests on the stomach contents because it would be, and I quote, too messy. This guy had to have been voted it. He's not a real fucking medical. There's no way. Too messy. Like that's too your, messy. That's your whole your whole entire job is messy and wily and I was crazy sh- and nothing. smelly and what? Like literally. That's the field you went into, your brother. Whole, you walk into that room and it's just your mess smells everything. Of course. What are you doing? Have you ever, honey? Coroner, dear coroner from 1950, whatever, or 1960, whatever. (sighs) Have you performed an autopsy before? Because I don't think you have. There's no way you have if you're like, that would be messy. Oh, no, he had. He had because he he had also, he had fucked up cases for them in the past. I'm I think you're right. I didn't, I I forgot about that whole thing where like they were voted in. Yeah. I'm looking it up because this is not. Too messy, he said. This is not. No. Yeah. But fortunately for the prosecution, moving away from that for a second, fortunately for the prosecution, Patricia's husband, Walter Jones, did actually allow them to exhume Patricia's body so that a proper autopsy could be conducted. Well, thank goodness. And realistically, you can't even call it a proper autopsy at that point because she's already been fucking embalmed, but they could do way better than this guy did. Yeah. Now, in addition to retrieving the remaining bullets, the new pathologist, like a legit one, Dr. Charles Charles Wheeler, he was able to determine that what Patricia ate before the murder. She had pickles and salami, which that's a girl dinner. That is. That truly is. And I would eat that and I want that right now. But he also confirmed that she had not been sexually assaulted and he was able to confirm the sequence in which the bullets had entered the body. So this guy is legit. Yeah. Now, the new autopsy results were encouraging to the prosecution because they not only retrieved those remaining slugs, but they also concluded that the murder was not motivated by sexual deviance or robbery, leaving the most likely explanation to be a personal grudge. Yeah. Why else would this woman have been murdered? Of course. Murdered? Yeah. Now, for Sharon, the investigation into both Patricia and James's deaths were immediately a big inconvenience. With the murder case reopened or opened in James's death, the insurance company stopped any payments on her claims, which left her with little money for her expensive defense attorneys or her expensive or her excessive spending and basic needs. Yeah. So she was like in a bad place. 
Now, in response, she ended up putting her house on the market. She sold her car, and she hoped that the money from those two things would keep her afloat until her payments resumed because she believed they would. Yeah, of course. Now, as detectives and the prosecution kept building the case against her, or the cases, the introduction of Sharon's defense team slowed things down considerably because at every step of the way, they challenged almost everything everything the prosecution said or did or tried to admit or of course anything and because of that uh, actually a full year passed before either case finally went to trial and when they did finally go to trial things did not look as good as the prosecution had hoped Uh oh yeah sharon's trial for the murder of patricia jones began june 12th 1961 with opening statements being given on the afternoon of June 14th. In his statement for the prosecution, J. Arnett Hill presented the state's case. They believed Sharon Kinney had been having an affair with Walter Jones, and after he refused to divorce his wife, she lured Patricia to this meeting place and shot her to death. Once she killed Patricia, Sharon dumped her body in an area known to be frequented by young people and staged the scene to, quote, give indications that a crime of sexual passion had occurred. Yeah, fully. Yeah, like... To me, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. But also, we have the background knowledge of everything else that has gone on in her life. Absolutely. The, unfortunately, the jury did not. Yeah. Did you get anywhere yet, by the I way? I did. So I did see that you were, because this is called a coroner at this point. Yep. They do now in Jackson County have, an, they have a medical examiner. Oh, okay. And if she's a woman, she looks like a badass. I don't know. I'm just saying. Hell yeah. She's the chief medical examiner. Let's go, But girl. she's a medical examiner. She is a doctor. She is a forensic pathologist. Like, she is there. But... It says in the state of Missouri, uh, larger urban counties operate under medical examiner jurisdiction, while smaller counties by statute operate under coroner jurisdiction. And it says coroners from several rural Missouri counties uh, contract with the Jackson County Medical Examiner's Office for autopsy services when needed. Ah. But I'm assuming back in 1960, they just had an elected coroner because that's the difference between an Emmy and a coroner. Right. As a coroner is usually an elected layperson that has no fucking business it's so doing an wild autopsy. That that's like still something that happens. Yeah. So I think that's probably what happened here is that was an elected official who had no business doing this. I mean, if it's not the yeah. if that's not the case, I'm appalled. And if it is, I'm still appalled. I would be willing to bet a lot because that this was fact- an elected affi- official that is not a a medical doctor i would think so because the fact that he said it was going to be too messy and also just like looking for needles in a haystack it's like doing an autopsy after they had been embalmed like what what the fuck are you doing my guy when he said it would be too messy it's uh, that immediately i was like you're flag. you're elected like that's this is not like what wild but yeah. absolutely wild damn but going back to the prosecution's case their case was pretty straightforward it relied on a string of witnesses who told the jury they saw patricia with sharon kinney just before she disappeared they also relied on expert testimony from investigators and dr wheeler the actual yeah. medical like coroner here uh, and he explained the results of the second autopsy However, the prosecution still had several hurdles before them, particularly the initial botched autopsy that was going to really play a big part in this case and fuck it all up. And the fact that they still had, again, almost no physical evidence tying Sharon to this murder. Yeah. Now, the lack of uh, forensic evidence became apparent on cross-examination when Lieutenant Harry Nesbitt from the sheriff's department was asked about the guns collected during the search of the Kinney home. When defense attorney James Quinn asked which guns were collected, Nesbitt explained that they had confiscated a 22 rifle, an automatic pistol that had belonged to Sharon's father, and a, quote, blank pistol, uh, excuse me, blank pistol, which won't shoot. However, Nesbitt testified none of the guns were a match for those used in the murder of Patricia huh. Jones. And remember... Somebody that Sharon had worked with had come forward and said, like, she made me buy her this gun. Yep. And she said she left it with family in Washington. But it sounds like they were never able to locate that gun. So uh, that's okay. why so that's none still, of these are yeah, much. Yeah, still hanging out there. And it's like, yeah. Exactly. Makes sense. Now, the conflicting autopsy reports, like I said, made things even worse for the prosecution. During his examination of the original coroner, Dr. Hugh Owens, the prosecutor, could barely hide his contempt for this guy. He believed and actually publicly accused him of compromising their case. Yeah. 
I don't During blame him. questioning, Owens was described as having, quote, smiled frostily, evidently recalling that the handling of the body at the time resulted in a dispute between his office and law enforcement authorities, who charged that an inadequate postmortem examination had limited the collection of vital evidence. Yeah. Which also, that answers our question. He's a doctor. Ugh. So he is a legit. It sounds this like is... he is legit. Yeah, because what is, his name is... Uh... Dr. Hugh Owens. What the fuck? Yeah. Now, the results of the conflicting reports meant that the prosecution now couldn't be precise about a lot of the important details, the time of death, the presence of any chemicals or any drugs in Patricia's system, and the presence of any hairs or fibers on the body during the autopsy. So this, the fact that they had to perform a second autopsy, you would think originally like, oh, wow, that's great. Like, thank goodness they got to do that. Yeah. But it actually fucked everything up because now those two reports were directly conflicting with each other. Uh, and it makes it look like you don't have any idea what's yeah, going on here. It's true. So while the conflicting medical reports were undoubtedly the biggest hurdle for the prosecution to clear, their additional witnesses didn't do much to help. The day after Hill's frustrating examination of Dr. Owens... Walter Jones took the stand and told the jury about his relationship with Sharon Kinney, his attempt to end their relationship, and the enraged threats that he made to her when he found out that she'd been seen with Patricia right before she disappeared. Uh, The admissions didn't exactly endear him to the jury, but what was more problematic was that he described Sharon as being very willing to allow him to search her and her belongings for weapons, and he told the jury that she offered to aid in the search for Patricia. Oh, damn. I mean, after he forcibly held a knife to her throat. But I mean, yeah, there was that. There was the whole that of it. There was that. But they were like, okay, well, she was like willing to help you. Yeah. So like, so, like who, what the who fuck? does that yeah. when they've actually killed the person? Now, that same day, the defense offered the additional slugs into evidence, the ones that had been fired from the gun that Sharon had her coworker buy a few weeks before the murder. The gun had been purchased in a private sale, but the investigators had actually managed to track down the previous owner who led them to a location that he used for target practice, and ballistics technicians were able to pull several slugs from a tree. So while they couldn't locate that particular gun, they located the man who had Ah, owned it, and they got his slugs from that gun. Which, like, that that was was pretty good police work. I was going to say, that was good police work. But unfortunately for the prosecution, the slug admitted into the evidence was a match for the caliber of the gun, but could not be confirmed as the same model used in Patricia's death ah. because they didn't have it right yeah. there. Now, given the amount of circumstantial evidence versus the lack of forensic evidence in the prosecution's case, the defense really didn't have to work that hard on Sharon's behalf. They said it was true that she'd been seen with Patricia just before her death. You know, she'd been thoroughly uncooperative in the investigation. And actually, she'd been overheard at one point by law enforcement officials boasting that, quote, as long as we didn't have the gun, we couldn't prove it was her. Wow. But they said none of that conclusively linked her to Patricia's murder. In fact, their case was even more simple than the state's. They said Sharon might be guilty of having an extramarital affair. That doesn't make her a killer. Shit. They went, like, pretty simple. Yeah, they went really simplistic with it. So rather than even try to prove her innocent... All they did was undermine the flimsy evidence that had been put forth by the prosecution. Now, among those called to testify by the defense was Donald Fitzpatrick, a man who claimed he was at the Lover's Lane area with his, quote, married woman companion. (laughs) He testified that they hadn't seen any body or evidence of a murder when they were at the scene a short time before Patricia's body was discovered. And given that the prosecution claimed Patricia had been killed at that location— Fitzpatrick's testimony actually undermined the credibility of their case. Oh, damn. Because how did she get there? If she if she was killed there, he would have seen her, they're saying. Oh. Yeah. This is getting a little wily. It is. Wily, this this is brought to you by the word wily. Wily, yes. <laughs> Very true. So damn. the defense took less than two days to present their mm. case. And on June 23rd, 1961, the jury went into deliberation. After just an hour and a half, they returned with a verdict of not guilty. What? And they cited the prosecution's heavy reliance on conjecture as the reason for the verdict. So basically they're saying, like, you're just saying that because she had an affair with this woman's husband, that you're, like, jumping to conclusions here. And it's just reasonable doubt. Exactly. Like, you're just putting reasonable doubt in there. Exactly. Now, when asked for a comment, Sharon simply smiled and told reporters, I feel as good as I can. Yeah, I bet you do. 
So her lead defense attorney, James Quinn, this is so stupid. On the other hand, he had more to say on the matter. He told the press, actually, there was a power outside this courtroom affecting this verdict, the hand of providence. Which is like a religious thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he went on to address questions about the reason for the verdict, saying, you cannot speculate. You cannot base your judgment on speculation, conjecture. It's like, okay, we get I it. You I won. already did, though. Everybody did. I did. We're all speculating. I know she did it. Stay speculating. <laughs> Stay speculating on this one. So Sharon Kinney had managed to get away with one murder because she did murder Patricia Jones, as we all know. Yeah. And don't worry. We'll find out for sure later that she very much did. <sighs> and in the wake of the acquittal, she entered into her next murder trial, confident that a similar lack of evidence would lead to a similar verdict. Oh, no. I don't know. So... With the first trial behind them, the prosecution and the defense started preparing for the second one, scheduled to begin January 8th, 1962. Coincidentally, it was actually to take place before the same judge, Judge Tom Stubbs, who presided over that first trial, which also makes you nervous because she just got acquitted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, defense attorney Quinn and the rest of Sharon's, def Sharon's defense team felt pretty confident they could get their second acquittal. The case against Sharon in the death of James seemed even weaker than the prosecution's case against her and Patricia Jones's death. And on top of that, they were barred from admitting any new evidence. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And with the initial determination of accidental death, that would be pretty hard for the, for the prosecution to get around. So after one day of jury selection, opening statements began January 9th. And again, J. Arnett Hill laid out the state's case. According to him, just weeks before her husband's death, both Sharon and James had confided to others that their marriage had essentially come to an end, and they had both expressed interest in getting a divorce. The problem, though, was that neither of them seemed willing to agree to the other's terms, which made that divorce seem unlikely. So, when Sharon came to the realization that she was not going to get out of her marriage as easily as she hoped, and she wasn't going to come out of it with as big a, a payout as she had hoped, she, quote, called a man named Donald Boone, telling him she had something dirty for him to do. What? And offered him $1,000 to kill her husband. Where the fuck did this come from? Left field, baby. What? So, Hill ends up calling John Boldies to the stand, intending to have him confirm a previous statement that he had given to investigators about Sharon having offered him a thousand dollars to kill Shut her the husband fuck up. i knew it i knew this little two-year-old did not kill a man no he didn't come on she's even worse she blamed her two-year-old daughter yeah she's the murder a of her of own garbage. father she sucks holy shit but in his deposition john boldy's there given before the trial he told the prosecutor about how sharon had offered him the money to kill james and implied that they could be together with james out of the way he said all of that in his deposition. But on the stand, Boldies insisted Sharon wasn't serious and the offer was, quote unquote, in a joking fashion. No one jokes about hiring you as a hitman to kill their husband who they hate and have been trying to get away from for a long time. And if you no are- No one jokes about that! <laughs> if you are around someone who is joking about hiring a hitman, get as far away from that human as humanly possible because again, they're not, they're not joking. joking. Even if you think they are, they're not. They're serious. Why does this happen all the time in these cases where someone's like, I don't know, they were just joking about killing their dad. And it's like- Never. We fucking joking about it. Never in my life have I been like, what if I gave you I've like never this- Joked this about specific this. amount of money to murder my loved one. I've never had a fully fleshed out joke JK. about murdering anyone that I love. Hello, like, it is just not real. All I can picture in my head is Teresa this going, man. funny, laugh, ha ha. Like, this is just not real. Like, this guy sitting on this stand saying, like, she was always joking. She was always so funny. She's just kidding. She was always so silly. Ha ha. She doesn't share a gal. She was always just making these crazy jokes. She's doing a tight ten about She's me wily. killing her husband if I give if I, she gives me a thousand dollars. No, idiot. Especially when someone's offering you a monetary reward for killing this person, and then they're like, "Just kidding." Like, when are you no. gonna learn? When are you gonna learn? Guys, it gets worse. I'm so annoyed by this thing. <laughs> this this is brought to you by the word the word Wiley in the phrase. It gets worse. It gets worse. He also God. insisted that there was a quote unquote typo in his deposition testimony, in the section where he quoted Sharon as saying, "quote I got my husband taken care of, and I thought we could be together." He said, "It should have read business, not husband. I got my business taken care of." 
That's quite a fucking typo. That's a real typo. I love when people claim typos and it's like a whole ass word. It's like, that's not a typo. It's you like, just type the word you meant to type in. Oops. A, a typo would be if they spelled husband wrong, if yeah. they were like hub sand. <laughs> exactly. That's a typo. <laughs> husband and business, not so much. What she meant was you said something that was pretty fucking uh, damning and you're like, oops, I didn't mean to say that damning thing. So no. I actually meant to say this not super damning thing, but still kind of damning. It's also like, damn, motherfucker, you were really scared of her, huh? Like because you're si- you're sitting there safe in your deposition in the hands yeah, of police, being but in like, front of her. "Oh my gosh, she said all of this, and I'm ah, she's in front a of crazy, like, cool woman." Didn't say that. But he's like, "Sharon, I she's, would never." She's the comedian of our generation, Sharon. and I'm not, I didn't say that at all. <laughs> I would never be smirched your name like that, Sharon. You have to believe me. He's like, "No, she should have a Netflix special." Oh my god, she's so funny. No way. jokes. Haha. She does it for the lols. <laughs> Wow. So Sharon's defense attorney, James Quinn, there, he seized on the inconsistencies. Thank goodness. And, well, no. He's, or no. Oh, it's yeah. her defense attorney. I, I, I see why you thought, thought that. that. Yeah. He seized on the inconsistency in Boldiza's story. In his cross-examination, he asked, it was obviously a joke, wasn't it? It was just like if I'd said to you, John, I'd give you a $100 to see you jump off of City Hall, wasn't it? He's like, we're all just lolling and laughing and having good times with each other, John, right? We're all just comedians. We're all just so funny. Our jokes are great. But despite what Boldiz had previously told the prosecutor, the implication of defense attorney Quinn's question was that, you know, any rational person would consider such a discussion to be a joke and Sharon obviously wasn't serious about hiring someone to murder her husband. I literally can't. We, I can't when this is a defense. Can't. Like, no. I literally can't. When it's like jokes, everybody jokes. It's, it's like, like I, mm. no. Jokes are what, no. Like, jokes are jokes. Yep. I love a good joke. Oh, I'm, yeah. I love comedy. I am for comedy. Same. But when you joke about killing your husband and offering someone money to do so, and then your husband gets murdered, it's pretty weird. That's a problem weird. for you. And that's when jokes are not fun. Like, that's a problem. Of course it is. That's why joking about hitmen is not a great idea. Not funny. Ugh. So in their closing arguments, both sides rested their cases. The prosecutor contended that Sharon had killed James in order to get rid of him and cash in on his various life insurance policies. And the defense maintained the initial conclusion that it was an accidental shooting and Sharon was the funniest woman in all of history. And Quinn reminded the jury of the obvious lack of evidence in the case, saying, and then, with no more evidence than in the initial investigation, the charge just changed to murder? But the jury went into deliberation on the afternoon of January 11th, and they deliberated a little over an hour before court was adjourned for the day. Outside of the courthouse, a confident James Quinn told reporters, we feel Sharon will be acquitted in this case. We believe the state's evidence failed to hit the mark. And he was right. The state really didn't have the strongest case in the world, which is why it came as a surprise to nearly everyone when the jury returned the next afternoon with a guilty verdict. Damn! They said, guilty. What the fuck is going on? (laughs) (laughs) Where am I? So the press noted that the outcome of the case, quote, hinged on the testimony of John Boldies. And the reporter said that his attempts to reframe his earlier testimony as nothing more than a joke actually ended up making <laughs> Sharon you. look way more suspicious. It absolutely did. Now, Sharon appeared to give no reaction or show any real emotion when the verdict was read. But the matron who booked her into the jailhouse that afternoon told the press she had little tears in her eyes and she said she didn't feel good. Now, the next day, Sharon gave an interview to the press saying, I think the verdict was a mistake. Something went wrong. And when it came to why this bitch, when it came to why she believed she'd been convicted, she said, for a while, I thought it was a good idea to have a woman on the jury. Now I don't think so. Oh, fuck off, Sharon. (laughs) Fuck right off. Implying that the sole female juror had been jealous or judgmental and that led to the guilty verdict. No, it's the fact that you're an ice cold fucking killer who blamed this on your child, asshole. And you know what? That's the thing. It's further cements the idea that you would blame a death on your two year old daughter. You suck. And also kill the woman who is married to the man you're having an affair with who you don't even love. Sharon is not a girl's girl. You are not a fucking fucking girl's girl Sharon she's not and you, you're honestly not even a guy's girl I don't know what you are but you're she sin- kind of your sinister girl. vibe yeah your sinister vibe she is sinister vibe <laughs> so Sharon received a life sentence for the murder of her husband bye and during her first year in during her first year in jail her lawyers and supporters petitioned the court to have her released on bail citing her children as a reason for the request I'm like y'all she blamed one of them for this 
I'm sorry, what? Like, she got, what? She, what? She just got convicted of murder. And you're like, no, she has babies. She just got convicted of murder, of which she blamed her two-year-old daughter for. I'm saying. And you're like, but you should take care of those kids. I'm like, I don't think she should be anywhere fucking near those children. Are you kidding me? No. What Uh, is happening over there? I don't know. Missouri is not all right. Missouri, Independence, Missouri is out here wild and wild. Are you okay? No. The answer is no. Is there anybody out there? You all right? I mean, hopefully now. Twice if you need help. Like, this is is wild. I hope it's gotten better since then. One would. Damn. I don't think Sharon's there anymore. I can tell you that much. But the petitions were repeatedly denied, but the ongoing coverage of the now completed trial did help win Sharon's sympathy from the support in the public. And while the support was not enough to overturn the verdict... Who's the public? (laughs) Independence. It did prompt a reevaluation of the trial. Shut up. During the (sighs) reevaluation, defense attorney Quinn there argued repeatedly that Sharon was deserving of a new trial because of several administrative errors. Initially, the petitions were denied, like I said, but when the case finally reached the state Supreme Court in early 1963... The justices agreed with the defense and ordered Sharon to receive a new trial. I gotta go. So in July, she was freed on a $25,000 bond. She had literally been convinced. Elena just smacked her microphone and banged into the wall. She is out E5,000. She said, I gotta go. She said, I quit. I can't. This is so frustrating. She had been acquitted of one murder, sentenced to life in prison for another, and all this, and then they're like, actually, I don't think so. And then they just let her walk. They just I, let her walk. No, no, absolutely so, not. Even though she'd been freed on a technicality, the growing wave of support for her freedom was a strong indicator of what was to come. Yeah. And of course, uh, over the course, sorry, not of course, <laughs> over the course, you would. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know where I was. Um, this is a frustrating case. It's very frustrating. <laughs> Over the course of 1963 and 1964, the prosecutor's office would retry Sharon two more times, both resulting in a mistrial. The first because of a jury member's undisclosed conflict of interest. Come on. I'm like, you and Sharon fuck. I was just going to say, was that the reason? (laughs) Not a doubt in my mind. And the second because of a deadlocked jury, which was actually leaning in favor of acquittal. Oh, my gosh. Now, despite the jury. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. (laughs) Go listen to Scream. Oh, my God. (laughs) So, despite the jury leaning toward acquittal in the third trial, the prosecutor's intent to try Sharon for a fourth time for the murder of James Kinney was untenable. After years in courtrooms and jail cells, the entire process had become exhausting for Sharon. She for was, us, too. And for us <laughs> and everybody Honestly. in independence. She was splitting her time between her trials, her children, and her part-time job. Now she was working at a motel. So in a mo- uh, moment of impulsivity, she decided to quit her job, figuring that it would allow her to spend more time with her kids. So, uh, evident or uh, allegedly so she went down to the employment office to apply for benefits okay. now this is insane it was at the employment office in august of 1964 that sharon first laid eyes on frank puglisi who was ahead of her in line struggling to understand the paperwork he was being asked to fill out oh no like many of sharon's lovers puglisi was a blue collar guy who dropped oh, no. out of high school at 16 And, you know, had been drifting around the Midwest for years, taking random jobs where he could find them. He also had a criminal history of petty crimes and had spent short stints in jail. And actually, he had recently gotten out of jail. That's why he was looking for work at the employment office. Awesome. Somehow, Sharon involved herself in his struggle with the paperwork. And the two of them hit it off and started dating. This gal. What a meet cute. What a meet cute. She is quitting her job and applying for benefits, you know, awaiting her murder trial. And she meets a man who just got out of jail. Honestly, meant Sharon, to be. Like, damn. Meant to be. Damn. Damn is right. This no. is wild. She's also, I'm pretty sure, like 28 or 29 at this point. Like, she's, I'm like, your 20s were such a ride, Sharon. Your 20s, oh, yeah. I, this is just outrageous. So after the stress of all of her legal woes, Sharon welcomed the male attention and affection, and she and Frank dated through the rest of the summer and into the fall. And just like her other relationship, Sharon and Frank fell for each other very fast, 
and by September, she convinced him to sign what she considered an informal marriage contract. Wow. Like, they didn't legally get married, but she was like, sign this. It says we're married. Some people just have this this way. I don't get it's it. It's amazing. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what Sharon possessed, but I'm just like, shocked. I don't know. She was, she was good at something. But the wow. problem, however, was that her new trial was set to begin in early October. Oops. And despite her uncanny ability to dodge any and all responsibility, there was still a chance that she was going back to prison for the murder of her fucking husband. Yeah. Which I'm also like, Frank, you're really jumping onto this ship? Apparently. But if we know Sharon, we know she's got a scheme up that We sleeve. know Sharon. So about this is you're going to shit. Oh, no. About two weeks into September, she went to her lawyer's office and explained that she and Frank were in love and they wanted to take a vacation to Mexico before their trial before her trial began. Shut the fuck up. Now, given that she was still out of jail on a twenty five thousand dollar bond pending the outcome of the trial, there was some question as to whether she could travel or not. There was some question. There was lots of questions. There was there was inquiries into whether she should leave for Mexico. Like <laughs> Mexico? <laughs> I don't know why. I'm just losing my ability to speak. Her lawyer explained. <laughs> her lawyer explained it, it that as long as she was back before the no! trial began, it was okay with him. No! Just come back. No. <laughs> Just come back for your murder trial after going to Mexico. Have you ever watched Hurry a fucking back. TV show? God damn it. Hurry back now, Sharon. Hurry back now. You're here for your murder trial. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Fuck? I can't. But I, we're never seeing Sharon again. She's, <laughs> That's you know what's crazy? We are. We are going to see Sharon again in this case. At I least. can't predict shit in this case. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Like I said, brought to you by Wiley. So I'm crying. On the afternoon of September 12th, 1912, 1964, <laughs> Sharon made multiple trips to the local Safeway grocery store. As one does. Each time writing bad checks to get cash for her trip. For his part, Frank fell back on his old ways and stole food, cash, and other supplies from his friends and associates. Frank and Sharon. And also was able to borrow a car from a friend that he and Sharon would eventually take up to the border. My goodness. Or down to the border. Down to the border. <laughs> Later that afternoon. It's always down. I guess. Sure is. <laughs> Later that afternoon, with cash in hand and a carload of food and supplies, <laughs> Sharon dropped her kids off with her, I guess, ex-mother-in-law. And she and Frank took off for Mexico. So she just dropped her kids. And yeah, was like, she, she abandoned her children. Yeah. So they drove almost nonstop for two days until they reached Laredo, Texas, the last stop before crossing into Mexico. But unfortunately for them, without the proper paperwork or registration proving ownership of this vehicle, the border agents refused to let them go through Mexico or go through to Mexico in the car. And they were like, that's fine. They ditched it at the border and took the bus into Mexico City. This man borrowed a whole ass vehicle from his friend and then said, they just left it's at the it. border. It's at the border, sorry. We gotta go get it. The fuck? Now, although they'd made it pretty easily to their destination, neither of them spoke Spanish. Why the fuck are you gonna plan a trip to Mexico if you don't speak Spanish? Like, any Spanish whatsoever. <sighs> I have I don't know. You know, I don't know. The so, answer is I don't know. <laughs> so that made communication a pretty big problem. Did it? Yeah. Now, on September 14th, they checked into the Hotel Gin, which the couple chose simply for its quote unquote quaint name. I'm like, yep. you chose that hotel because you thought they had gin. Yeah, that, that checks. But when they arrived, they found that the hotel was anything but quaint. There were roaches climbing up the walls of the bathroom Ugh. and rats and mice running from one room to another before disappearing through the, the holes that were in the walls. No. Uh, it was also in a neighborhood that Sharon had deemed unsafe. So she kept a pistol and a hatchet by her bed at all times. Uh-oh. I have to say, Frank, baby, do you know... Do you, like, have you read the local paper oh, when you were no. back in Independence? Oh, no. You're sleeping next to a woman who is supposed to head to trial soon for the murder of her husband, and you go to sleep next to her at night when next to her is a hatchet and a pistol? Oh, no. The wild thing? It's not Frank. It's not Frank? It's not Frank. Wow, that's I it. thought it was going to be Frank. No. So after a few days enjoying the local nightlife, Frank and Sharon were running very low on money, and they were both really sick from an excess on local food and alcohol. 
probably more alcohol than yeah. food. So on Friday, September 18th, Sharon left the hotel gin to go in search of an English-speaking pharmacist who could give them something for their stomachs, and she brought her pistol with her for protection. Now, after struggling to find anyone who could accommodate her, a local man directed her to the Del, Pr uh, Del Prado Hotel, a hotel that catered to American tourists, where she could definitely find somebody who spoke English and Spanish. Now, the first person person that she encountered at the hotel was Francisco Paredes um, Ordonez, a Mexican-born resident of California who was in Mexico to visit his family. Oh. Now, Sharon was already fed up with Frank and the frustrations of running low on money, so she welcomed the opportunity for some male attention. Oh, fucking Sharon. And with the pistol tucked in her pocket, she did not hesitate when Francisco uh, suggested that they go back to his room for a few drinks. He thought she was pretty. Now, what happened next is a matter of debate. And if you're putting any money on Sharon, I don't know what I can do for you. Yeah. But according to Sharon, after two or three drinks with uh, Francisco, she got tired and laid down on the bed to go to sleep for a while, take a little nap. She claimed that she was woken around 3 a.m. when he tried to, quote, sexually uh, attack her sexually. And she said, believing herself to be in danger, she drew the pistol from her pocket and fired twice into his chest, killing him instantly. Now, the noise drew the attention of the hotel's night manager, Enrique Rueda, who ran to the room to find out what the fuck was going on. Now, coming upon the scene of an unknown woman, woman having shot one of the hotel guests, he attempted to detain Sharon while he contacted police. And that's when she raised the gun and shot him in the back, leaving him in critical condition. Yeah. yeah. But despite his gunshot wound and eventual critical condition, he managed to lock her in the bathroom while he contacted Holy police. Shit. This man is a hero. And the police arrived a short time later. Now, having left one of the men at the hotel alive, there was no question of Sharon's involvement in the shooting. But there was some question as to who the fuck she was. When they arrived in Mexico, Sharon and Frank checked into the hotel that they were at as Mr. and Mrs. Frank Puglisi, but her identification said otherwise. So a representative from the embassy told reporters, we were a little confused about this girl, but Kinney was the name on her tourist card. And when they did confirm her identity, officials learned that she was due in court just a few weeks later to stand trial for the murder of her husband, a date that now she would not be making. My God. So... Even though she maintained that she'd only shot Francisco in self-defense, Sharon also made several unexpected comments to the authorities at the embassy, including telling one man, I've shot men before and managed to get out of it. What the fuck? She, I don't think she gave a fuck at this point. She's just like, I just sh I shoot men on a regular basis and I get through it, so I'm not really worried about this. It's kind of my thing. Damn. It's like, girly, you're in an unknown territory Damn. right now. So a few days later, once they were confident that Rueda would live, Mexican authorities announced plans to charge and try Sharon Kinney for the murder of Francisco Ordonez, whom they believe she murdered in an attempted robbery. Ah, which that makes sense. I believe, too. Yep. She was running low on cash. It's clear mm -hmm. what she was doing. Yeah. Now, while officers from the Mexican Secret Service investigated the shooting, Sharon was taken to uh, Lecumberi Prison in Mexico City, where she was to be held until the trial. Now, unlike the trials in the United States, she had no support in Mexico, and her only connection was with her embassy-appointed lawyer, Hijino Lara, uh, Hijinio Lara. On September 26, 1964, both Sharon and Frank Puglisi were arraigned on murder charges. I don't know if it was because, like, some kind of, mm, like, they thought they maybe, thought it like, was a plot. Oh, conspiracy, yeah. exactly. Uh, later... The charges against Frank were dropped and he was deported back to the U.S. But Sharon continued to be held at that prison. Damn. And she was fucking furious that she was being denied bail for the shooting. Now, having learned of her arrest and imprison uh, imprisonment, the Mexican press dubbed her La Pistolera. Ah, uh, that's where it comes from. Which translates in, uh, to the holster in English. Ah, uh, okay. Which I thought it would translate to the pistol. But it's like the pistol holder. Exactly. Holster, yeah, exactly. Mm. The holder. Now... Having learned of the shooting and arrests, authorities in Independence, Missouri, contacted Mexico Secret Service to request that the pistol used in the shooting be sent to the U.S. for tests. Oh, Mexican man. authorities declined the request, citing the open case, but they did agree to send spent shells to detectives in Missouri. 
when the shells were tested by a ballistics expert at the crime lab, quote, they announced the spent bullets were identical to those found under the body of Patricia Jones. In and under the body of Patricia I Jones. I knew it! But unfortunately, at that point, Sharon had already been acquitted of Jones's murder. Fuck double murder. jeopardy and shit. So the prosecutor had no choice but to publicly declare that the murder had been solved and the, and the case was closed. Oh. The fucking double jeopardy of it all. So Sharon finally went on trial in a Mexican court in the fall of 1965, where she pleaded not guilty to a myriad of charges, homicide, causing bodily injuries, illegal use of firearms, and possession of false documents. Damn. In her defense, Hegenio Lara, or Lara told the three-judge panel that Sharon had fallen asleep in the bed and was awoken when Francisco climbed on top of her in what she believed was an attempted sexual assault. But the panel of judges felt like the evidence didn't support that claim, and she was found guilty of simple homicide Bye. and sentenced to 10 years. Jeez. I was like, that's all you get for homicide? Yeah. Um, at the and she was sentenced at the newly constructed women's prison in I hope I say this right, is to Pala, is to Palapa, which is well. just outside of Mexico City. Now, after she served the sentence, she would be deported back to the United States. So news of Sharon's imprisonment, of course, spread around the Midwest and the Southwest, which prompted tons of news agencies to send reporters to Mexico to interview her. And each time she maintained her innocence and stuck to her story, assuming that she would soon be free on appeal and back in the U.S. It's unclear if she knew this or not, but her sentence carried the provision that she had to serve two thirds of it before she was even eligible for any kind of appeal. Oh, damn. In her case, that would have meant she had to serve six and a half years before being eligible. Whoa. Now, in an interview with a reporter from Missouri, Sharon spent most of the time talking about how much she hated the food at the prison, how the, quote, language barrier frightened her, and how the other inmates had stolen all of her personal belongings within days of her arrival, which I think is funny. Sucks. Sucks to suck. There was a ton of interest in the case just after the conviction, but the press coverage slowly faded as the months passed, and by the winter of 1966, her name was hardly appearing in the U.S. papers. The next time she would come up in the news was in an interview with the Kansas City Star in March of 1969. By that point, she'd settled into life in, at the prison and told the reporter, Kevin Kelligan, that she stopped planning for the future. He said, she reminded me of a waitress you'd find at a truck stop. She liked to talk and she gave you the impression she'd been around. Damn. I was like, oof, <laughs> Kevin. Ooh, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> Such a Kevin thing to say. It truly is. Now, despite what she told old, old Kevin there, <laughs> it turned out that she hadn't exactly given up on her future entirely. Something told me that. On the evening of December 7th, 1969, after serving five of the 10 year sen five years of the 10 year sentence, 29 year old Sharon Kinney attended a movie in the prison recreation hall. Later that evening, when guards made their rounds to do bed checks, they discovered Sharon was missing. Fuck you. Dis no. They discovered that what? she was missing. Officials searched the prison and its grounds all evening, but turned up no signs of Sharon Kinney, and eventually were forced to make a public statement to alert the press and citizens that she had escaped. She had escaped <sighs> prison in Mexico City. Shut up. In Mexico City, police and prison officials had absolutely no fucking clue how she managed to escape from high security modern prison, saying, quote, or saying only that. it was that like newly constructed. Newly constructed yeah. and like a, a high security prison. Yeah. They said she, quote, probably bribed several jail wardens to let her go. Honestly, I believe probably. It. An intensive multi-agency search was mounted for her, covering a wide radius around the prison. But after weeks of turning up legit zero evidence, authorities announced in mid-December that they would be easing up the hunt like it was Holy costing shit. too much money. A spokesperson for Mexico City Police told reporters, our department will continue to hold the case open until Mrs. Kinney is found, but we are not any closer to finding Mrs. Kinney in Mexico City oh than the day God. she escaped. Today, more than 50 years after her escape from prison, Sharon remains a fugitive in Mexico and the United States, and the authorities are not any closer to finding her than when she did escape. What the fuck? Now, with each passing year, it's it becomes more and more unlikely that she's still alive. She's like 83 at this She'd point, She'd be 83 right? this math. year, yeah. <laughs> but if she were apprehended today, she would still face charges in Mexico for the escape, 
and she would face charges in the United States for the murder of James Kinney. But she has never been found. That woman just fucking barreled through life, causing fucking havoc. 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 And here, loss, there, and everywhere. And night, just terror. And then she just escapes. And she killed at least three people. I'm sorry. Sharon killed more than three people. Yeah. I know she did. Oh, yeah. But that, she killed at least three. That truck driver that she was, like, married to before she married James Kinney, oh, allegedly. Yeah, that, like, went off a cliff. Oh, that was the first one. What's up with that? Yeah, what's up with what's that? What's up with that? He went off a cliff? No. I don't know about if that. If he went off a cliff, it was, there was something going on. Something happened there. But that is the story of Sharon Kinney, a.k.a. La Pistolera. I don't even know what to say about that story. There are not words I for had this woman's no wiliness. Idea. Neither did I. I had no idea. Neither did I. I was just Googling, like, I forget even what I typed in to, Holy to find this case, but I, I started reading about it, and I was like, Dave, I got a case that we have to look into. Oh, my God. God. Dave was like, who is this woman? Like, what? Who is this woman? <laughs> Who's that girl? I'm shocked. And appalled. Shocked, appalled. The fact that she's just roaming around somewhere. Like, what? Like, if she's alive, she's an 83-year-old lady. She could be your grandma. She could be your grandma, guys. You're listening right there. She could be your grandma. I do hope that She could be kids... your grandma's friend. She could be. She could be your, just your grandma. That's crazy. That's right. She could be your straight up grandma. But I hope that her kids are okay. That's what makes me so sad. I want to know what I'm like. I'm it sounds like, like they're all right. She, I mean, she left them with James Kinney's parents. It so sounds hopefully like. James Kinney's parents just took care of them. And yeah. I hope they they're doing okay. Life. Yeah. They had a lot of upheaval in the early damn. years. Yeah. And I hope Dana knows that she didn't shoot her dad. Yeah. She that's the other thing. Dad. She didn't shoot her. No fucking no. way. No. Sharon did it. And it's gross that it's Sharon even slightly Gross implied. isn't even the word. It's like, there are not words for That's, the fact that she implied so that. It's so gross. Ugh. Yeah. What a fucking wow. wild tale. Wow. That's real. Yeah. So, with that, we hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. weird. But not so weird as any of this, because what oh the actual God. fuck, Sharon? I'm just like... Sharon! I can't put words together. Sharon!